thank thee. For allowing us to enter into your gates with thanksgiving. And into your courts with praise. Thank you for giving us yet another opportunity to lift up holy hands and praise the name of law of the Lord. It's good to be in the house one more time. I want to get to what God has to say this morning because if I don't, I may not be able to get it out. But Romans 8 and 29, uh, I've preached this passage some years back, but Last Sunday, the Lord dropped it back in my spirit. But Romans 8 and 29. Romans 8 and 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Amen. I spoke to you a little while ago. Um, I can't remember when it was, but I remember speaking to you about a marred image. Y'all remember that? Speaking to you about a marred image and how the fall marred the image of God, which was man. Today, I want to talk about restoring a marred image. Restoring a marred image. Beloved, God is everything holy. Whatever your idea of what holiness is, he's ten times more holy than that. You can, we don't have the logical capacity to fathom and comprehend the holiness and righteousness of this God. And yet this God created us in his image and after his likeness, meaning he formed and prepared a being to reflect himself. Do y'all agree with that so far? That's what he did. He's love. He's patient. He's kind. He's forgiving. He's long-suffering. He's holy. He's righteous. He's merciful. He's all of these things. He's And he created us after his likeness and in his image to be a reflection of what he is. Adam messed that up. Because as long as we were that, we had harmony with God. 
as long as we were that, we had fellowship and communion and community with God. We had that. We had that. Told you all I have the picture in my mind of just Adam just sitting on a rock in the garden talking to the Lord, talking about, let's just call that a hog. <laughs> what you think? You think that works? Look at his feet. And let's just call that a sheep. And let's call that bird a raven. Just talking with the Lord and the Lord saying, you know, Adam, that's good. I like that. That kind of fellowship, that kind of relationship. And the fall in the garden <laughs> disrupted all of that. And I don't think we truly understand how devastating that fall was, beloved, because sin is a dangerous thing. And Paul said that in me, which is my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. I need you all to realize how far that goes. Because when God cursed us, when he cursed the ground, he said thorns and thistles is going to spring forth. Remember, that it didn't even have to rain for the plants to grow. Man never had to till the ground or plant seed, yet fruit was going to be plenteous. And yet then we see after the fall, First siblings that are counted in scripture, Cain and Abel. Jealousy rose up in one. And it was enough to kill his own brother. You, you don't understand what I'm trying to say. This was the first family. And the first murder happened with his very brother because he was jealous of what he got versus what the other got. This is how deeply rooted our ugliness, our filthiness, our hatred, our sin truly is. This is what we are. This is what we are. Imagine you being God. Imagine you being God and you sculpt something to look like you. And then all of a sudden, when you look at it, you can't even identify it. It don't look like you made it. It don't smell like it belonged to you. <laughs> don't walk like you. Don't talk like you. What would you do with it? What would you do with it? Would you keep it in the house? Mm mm, it stink. Mm mm, mm mm. You can't stay in here. Mm mm. It's, it's contagious. Everything it touches, it's like a disease. What, what would you do with it? Throw it away. Get out of here, yeah. You throw it away. A marred image. And as holy as this God is, why would he want to fix it? That's some love, ain't it? He ain't even like you and I. He don't even love like you and I. His love, matter of fact, there ain't even, he is the definition of love. We don't try to define his love. What is his love? God. That's what his love is. No definition on his goodness. What is good? God is good. It's a character of his very being. Child of God. And yet, he chose Yet he chose, he who knew no sin, became sin for us. 
that as he put on our sins, our wretchedness, he put on you his righteousness just so you could come back in the house. That's what he did. That's what he did in the fullness of time when a man born of a woman came down 40 and two generations. Born under the law to do what? To redeem you. To redeem that which he had thrown away. This is what he did. And in doing so, God made sure he didn't do it in vain. In other words, he did not do that, okay? Now that we have a little bit of a better understanding of how great that was, okay? Because he did it while we were yet sinners. No good being found in you at all. Not an ounce of it. He did that very act of wrapping himself in flesh and dying a sinner's death. He made sure that in doing that and accomplishing that, it was not in vain. That it was not in vain. What do I mean? He did not do that hoping you will want to come home. Do you hear me? He did not do that hoping you will change your mind. Hoping you change your ways. Hoping you change your addictions and vices and hang-ups. He didn't do that in hopes you'll believe in him. Why would he do that? Last time he put something in your hands, you messed it up. Why would he do that? He just put a fruit in your hand and you messed it up. You think he's going to put salvation in your hands? You think he's going to do that? How many times were you out there and mom or daddy called you, sent you money, got you out of jail, did whatever they could, paid your rent, paid your bills, tried to get you off the street? Did you come home? No. Did you change your mind? Did you change your ways? Or did you just go back to mama with your hand out and your mouth open? Nothing changed about you. Think God going to put salvation in your hands? The devil is a liar. Child of God, he did this and he assured Himself, it would not be in vain. So therefore, before the foundation of the world, he elected himself a people. He elected himself a church, a bride, one body made up of many members. And he declared it exactly who would make up that bride, who will make up that church. And he wrote all their names down in a book. Amen. And he said, they call it the Lamb Book of Life. It said it was that they were not in the book of life for which the Lamb was slain. What does that mean? That Lamb was slain for who? Every name in the book. If your name ain't in the book, he ain't die for you. The only thing is, I don't know whose name is in there and who ain't. So I'm going to tell everybody he died for you too. <laughs> That's why we evangelize. It ain't my job to know who's born again, who's going to be saved, who's going to be in glory. That ain't none of my business. 
business because if I knew, then it would keep me from loving you. It would keep me from treating you like my brother or my sister if I knew you was going to hell anyway. But since I don't know, I got to love you. Since I don't know, I got to still tell you about this Jesus. Since I don't know if your name is in there or not, I still got to do what I've been called to do. But I do know this. Every name that's in that book, not one will be lost. Why? Because the lamb was slain for him. Now, he did all this, and in chapter 8 of Romans, he tells me in the first verse, for those people, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are what? In Christ Jesus. That means now, guess what? You're no longer on your way to hell. You were born on your way to hell. You ain't done nothing, but you was born on the way to hell. That's the road you was on. You was in the car, full of gas. <laughs> Already headed in the right direction. But then Jesus, in the counsel of his own will, his purpose, and his time, came and stopped the vehicle. Amen. Deposited his spirit and put you on a new course. Now, the problem is, you've been driving down this lane, this road, your whole life. And down this road had all the juju bees, gummy bears, and candy, and, and fluffy gravy, and sauce, and, and everything to feed your flesh that you wanted. Everything that looked good to your eyes, all the riches and the glory and everything was all along this trip and on that road. And now that you're on another direction, it looks scarce over here. You not ain't too many people on this road. Ain't too many ways to turn. It's only one road to go. Ain't no maneuvering around. Ain't no shortcuts. I'm scared on this road. And you want to go back ah, to this road. That's what you want to do. That's in your nature to do that. Because it's all you know is this road. But Jesus ain't no fool. God ain't no fool. God knew who you were. He know what you are. He made you. We might get surprised by what you do. But God ain't surprised at all. So this is what he did for you. And I'm through. Back in verse 29. He said, for whom he did foreknow, he predestined. That for connects us to verse 28. It connects us to verse 28. Y'all know that verse. Y'all won't quote all the time. <clears throat> for all things work together for the good of those. You think that's your bank account. <laughs> you think that's your bank account. You think that's your health. That's what you think. You think that's your children. No, baby, I'm sorry. That's not the good he's talking about. On, it's not the good he's talking about. That good ain't the good that you can just measure by man's standards. It's, it's, it's not the good he's talking about. What he's telling us is those people who he called according to his purpose, those whose name is in the book, he made a promise to you. He made a promise to you, and that promise is in direct correlation to the promise he made to himself to prepare himself a bride. Ah, help me, Holy Spirit. It's in direct correspondence to that. 
is direct relation to the promise he made to himself to prepare himself a bride, a church, a body made up of many members. And he said what? That he is preparing her to receive her without spot or wrinkle. That means every man, woman, boy, and girl that makes up that bride, that elect lady that is waiting on that great marriage ceremony, that everyone that is made up of that body, God made her a promise to make her look like the image of Christ. That's the promise. And you know what? That's the good. The good is that all of your suffering, all of your hurt, all your pain, all your disappointments, your situation, your circumstance, what, what you were born in, your parents, your siblings, your bad husband, your horrible wife, your jacked up children, all of that to be for your good is to make you look like Jesus. Somebody said that can't be right, preacher. What kind of God would want somebody to go through that kind of pain and suffering? My answer to you is a promise-keeping God. <laughs> Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 tells me this. Whom the Lord loves. Huh? Whom the Lord loves. And I told you all, he don't love everybody. It's my like, oh no, God loves everybody. He loves all his creation. But he don't love all his children by regeneration. Here what the writer of Hebrews is talking about in in chapter 12, in verse 6, he said, Whom the Lord loveth, he chastens and he scourgeth. Every son that he receives. In other words, all that the Father has given him, he, they will come to him, and he ain't going to lose none of them. And everyone that he receives, he will beat the, he's literally saying, I will beat the hell out of you. That's what he's saying. The text is literally saying, I will beat the hell out of you. Why? Because he knows that in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. Stop blaming the devil. It's God being your father. Because he says, if you endure chastening, then God dealeth with you. As sons and daughters, if you endure some pain and suffering, it's because he's dealing with you as a child. For what son is whom the father chastens? And he says, but if you are without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. In other words, he says, you a bastard. If you got a King James, read it. It's in there. I promise I ain't cuss. That's what he says. He says, you're a bastard and not a son. If I look at, Psalm, if I look at Psalms 119, look at, look, at, look, at, look at what he said. If I look at Psalms 119, and look, beginning at verse 67, he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. In other words, Lord, before you whooped my behind, I did whatever I wanted to. And you know what? I thought I was getting away with it. <laughs> but, but now, now I keep your word. If I look at 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Verse 75, I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are right. If he's God, if he's good, if he's love, whatever God judges, whatever God decrees, it must be right. 
and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. In faithfulness. God is, by not sparing the rod on you, God is being faithful to you. By not letting you get away with it, he's being faithful to you. Faithful in what? Faithful in being your father. Faithful in sanctifying you and bringing you closer to him and making you holy and fully what you are called to be. That's what he's faithful in doing. He's keeping his promise because he's coming back for you. And he wants you to be as fine and sexy as he's expecting. He wants you to be everything he's looking for. Because he wants you to be happy to see him. Child of God, restoring this marred image is sculpting. It ain't a mirror he's putting back together. It's a sculptor. And in sculpting, it takes hammer and chisel. In sculpting, it takes applying heat and pressure. He's making you look like him. He's making you look like him. So I say it all. <sighs> Help me out, Brother LaRue. <laughs> but Brother LaRue sometimes I tell him, beat the hell out of him, Lord. Amen. That's why I love him. Beat the hell out of him, Lord. Because, beloved, some of you need to go through what you're going through. Because you've been adopted. Because you've been adopted. You, you, you are of the household of faith. Your name is in the book. And yet you still want to go back to this road. Because it's familiar. Because it's comfortable. Because there's more cars traveling that way. And if somebody takes a shortcut or takes an exit, you're willing to go with them. We can go... Let's get there faster. <laughs> Let's get to hell faster. It, 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 it's a slow ride. If I just stick with what I'm doing. But let me go and take this adulterous road. Let me take this road of fornication. Let me take this road of homosexuality. Let me take this road of thieving and whoremonging and robbing and cheating and stealing and backbiting and gossiping. Let me take that road and get to hell a little faster. Because <laughs> on this other road, It's lonely. It's narrow. It's just straight. There ain't no veering. There might be some potholes. Might be some stumbling blocks. But somehow God allows us to maneuver around pitfalls to stay on this lonesome journey. I got to get out of here. Beloved, we ought to be like him. We ought to be like him. And he is restoring his image in you. Get over yourself. Have your pity party by yourself, but then get over yourself. And say, okay, Lord. I'm going through what I'm going through. Give me an ear to your spirit. Give me a will of obedience. Show me, oh God, 
what is not like you. Show me, oh God, what you're not pleased with in my life. Show me, God. And then when he puts you back on your feet, you still ain't going to run perfect. But you're going to have a little more speed behind you. <laughs> you're going to have a little more wind behind you. Your vision will be a little more clear. You'll get 2020. And you'll see that pitfall coming a mile away. As opposed to get getting right up on you. And you ain't got time to dodge it. His aim is to make you look like him. His moral character. Our present suffer sufferings for his future glory. Beloved, he said to us that the suffering of this present time is not to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. It's necessary. It's necessary for you to deal with that. For you to go through that. What good is it doing for you to sit up and wallow in your misery of your circumstances? Where has that gotten you? Huh? Where has that gotten you except for sleepless nights and tired mornings and headaches and weary eyes and where has it gotten you? And loneliness because people stop calling you because all you got is woe is me. Yeah. You stay like that, watch. You're going to be lonely next. You'll be lonely next. Child of God, that ain't going to get you nowhere. But if you look to Jesus, if you look to him, you can say, I know it does not yet appear what I shall be. But one of these old days, I'm going to see him. And I shall be like him. For I'm going to see him just as he is. And we shall be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye and caught up together to meet him in the air and I'm going home to be with my husband sit at the table drink wine rub my head and say I love you well done Because he's made me, he's shaped me, he's molded me according to his purpose. To him be the glory. Come on, brothers. To him be the glory. Restoring a marred image. Restoring a marred image. Ain't that something? That God can make you look like Jesus? Hmm? He's doing it too. Some of you can testify, I may not be what I ought to be. But I know I ain't what I used to be. I do know that. I ain't arrived. But I ain't who I was yesterday. Yeah. Some folk ought to be glad you ain't who you was yesterday too. Might have cut somebody. Might have hurt somebody. Thank God that he won't leave you to your reprobate self. 
Thank God he won't leave you alone. Thank God he keeps disrupting your home. Thank God he keeps disturbing things. You don't think God will disrupt some stuff? He went in the church turning over tables. You don't think he going to come in your house and turn stuff around? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God gets angry. People, I heard somebody, some fool say Ang anger is a sin. No, anger ain't a sin. Anger is an emotion. Anger is an emotion. If you stay in your anger, it becomes a sin. And it becomes a sin because then you become vulnerable for Satan to attack you. Because your guard is down because you so got doggone angry. It's an emotion. How can anger be a sin when God got angry? God didn't never get angry with Israel. Yes, he did. He got angry in the church when he turned them tables over. I can just see Jesus. What y'all doing? Y'all must be out y'all mind. Get this. I can see him doing that. What y'all think this is? And you know what? That's how he comes through our homes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Ain't you? Wait a minute. Ain't you, ain't you my child? And this how you living? Is that right? Ain't you my child? Ain't you my son? Ain't you my daughter? And this what you doing? And, oh, and you thought you was getting away with it? You didn't never think I was coming by, didn't you? You didn't think I was coming? Well, I'm here now. And now that I'm here, Turning stuff over, killing folk. He'll do it for your good. As his faithful promise. His faithful promise. That's right. Your hurt is his faithful promise to you. To make you look like him. Your shame is his faithful promise to you. That's why you're embarrassed by what you do. He wants you to feel some kind of way about it. You better, you better have some remorse. Because if you have no remorse, then you ain't none of his. Because his children hate what he hates. He's working on you. A chain fixing you up making you something new has come over making your outside look like the inside me. by changing your mind he changing your attitude he changed my life and now I'm free. He washed away all my sins and he made me whole.
Come. Oh. 